Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Today, we're going to do a deep dive on Chapter 10 of the book Reality Transurfing by Vadim Zeeland. If this is the first time you're hearing this podcast, that's great. You don't need to go back to the beginning chapter. Every chapter is in and of itself very interesting. Reality Transurfing is a wonderful book that has some incredible ideas in it. And I recommend if you go back, I have a playlist on my channel that has multiple videos and podcasts available that describe many of the fundamental ideas behind Reality Transurfing. Today's chapter 10 is about goals and doors. And it's one of my favorite chapters. When you achieve a goal using transurfing methods, it's almost, it's incredibly obvious. It's really amazing. This process, you don't have to believe it. If you apply the principles of this process, you can experiment with it and you can see things happen. How do you choose your own reality? That's the real question. We've talked so far about many different interesting concepts, linking the heart and mind, pendulums, energy. There's so many different things that we've talked about. The space of variations, the alternative space, and all of these concepts build into a model that's very interesting. But how do we achieve these goals? And what are the things that can stop us from achieving these goals? This chapter does a really good job of describing the process of goals and how doors can open for you and how you can realize your intentions. And so we're going to go through several major significant sections of this chapter. And um, I'm going to, if there's anything that I see, I'm going to talk about it as we go along. And the amazing thing about the, this particular series that I've done so far is every time I've done a deep dive on a concept or a chapter from this book, I have had incredible experiences that have occurred after I've done these episodes, all linked to the episode. I've had things, for instance, when I did the heart and mind episode, I had a bunch of different things come into my vortex that that were primarily because I had started to focus in on my heart. I've had multiple realizations and awakenings. Every single chapter is wonderful in that re- respect. And if you listen with me, maybe you can share in this awakening. I've already read these chapters, but it feels to me like when I'm reading it again, it's, it's all brand new to me. And that's what's so wonderful about this material. It's fresh. It's, it's very, very basic and to its core. And it's stuff you may already know. Deep down, you know this stuff is true. So the chapter 10 is goals and doors. And the main quote that he has is by breaking through stereotypes, you open doors. A lot of times that summary is very important in summarizing the entire chapter. It's a fairly long one. So the first section is called how to choose your own things. And in this chapter, we will talk about how to discern the true strivings of the soul from the false goals pendulums are everywhere trying to impose upon us. This is an important distinction that's mentioned in the heart and mind chapter. The idea is if you have a false goal, the pendulum wants you to do, it's very, it's much more difficult to reach that we have an extra power. When we go for goals that are, uh, that are aligned with our soul and with our heart. But how do we know this goal, this thing that I'm trying, I'm striving to achieve? Is it related to some pendulum? And if you don't know what a pendulum is, again, that is when more than one person shares a certain thought energy and an independent information structure is created that can feed on energy from you if you oppose it or if you go for it. And it becomes its own entity that can pull you into lifelines and timelines and change your reality. If you become aware of it, then by avoiding some of the traps of these pendulums, you can do incredible things. So the problem is that a false goal, however attractive it may seem, ultimately will not bring you anything but disappointment. When you chase after a false goal, you either achieve nothing, your efforts simply providing feed for pendulums, or having you achieve the goal, but discover it was not really what you wanted after all. 
How many times have you met people that went to college for four years, went to graduate school, that, for instance, they became a doctor or a lawyer, and then all that spent time and they didn't really want to do that after all, but they're stuck in these lives that they never wanted to live. If you're out there living it, it's okay. There's a chance to change everything. If you listen to the words that I discuss in Reality Revolution podcast in general, hidden in each of these episodes is a secret to overcome these things because I have had the same feeling as you in overcoming these crazy things that happen. And how can we change our lives? When you chase after a false goal, you either achieve nothing your effort simply providing feed for pendulums or having you achieve the goal but discover it was not really what you wanted after all. So if you had a situation like that where you didn't, something that you didn't want after all, keep listening. Is it really worth missing the unique opportunity of this life, spending valuable time correcting your mistakes? Despite the fact that a lifespan seems a long time It passes quickly and unnoticeably. And so it is essential that you learn to find the things that bring you personal happiness. I do not want to start this chapter with a theory as the reader is no doubt tired of complex theoretical explanations. Zeeland has tried as much as possible to keep the expression of ideas from being too heavy but fear he may not have always succeeded in doing so. As he says, this is perhaps unavoidable, as the questions we have touched on are a little offbeat, and the conclusions drawn no less unusual. Your mind would never have taken the ideas of transurfing seriously if I had not given at least some kind of theoretical basis for them. However, the worst is behind us, And Zeeland begins this chapter with questions of a more practical nature. So the clearest and simplest mark of your ability to determine your own goals is evident in the way you choose your clothes. Searching for new clothes can also be a good exercise in helping you to choose your own goals effectively. If you think back, there have probably been occasions when you have purchased something you thought was suitable, only later to discover that you do not like it anymore. It no longer suits you or it has some kind of defect. Now I can pretty much guarantee a hundred percent of you out there have gone and bought something at the store and you got home and it was like not what you thought or you wore it for a while. It was great. And then go back and it completely changed. There may also have been occasions when you saw something you liked and you bought it straight away without hesitation and are still happy with it. The difference between these items is that in the second scenario, they are meant for you. In the first scenario, they are meant for someone else. So he's using that for a goal. You ever get that pair of clothing? And even though it looks nice, it just doesn't fit you. It fits somebody else. And your goals are very much the same. The first type that attracted you is meant for someone else. It may be something you saw on a mannequin or something a friend was wearing. Just because something looks good on someone else does not mean it will necessarily look good on you. It may have nothing to do with a shortcoming in your figure or other virtues. It is terrible being a mannequin that everything looks great on. It is individuality successfully emphasized that makes an impression, not a copy, of the widely accepted notion of beauty. I know I am not the first person to have said this, but nonetheless, people spend a lot of time out shopping, not knowing what to buy. Knowledge of style, a feeling for fashion, and even good taste does not help. Even if you bought something you've searched for for a long time, you may still not be totally satisfied with your purchase. If you always want to be able to always to find exactly the thing that you are looking for, you have to learn to distinguish between things that are yours 
and the things that are meant for someone else. So imagine there is a lifeline with a bunch of stuff that's meant. Meant. M-E-A-N-T. He's using the word meant for you. It's all there for you. And there's also a lifeline for someone else. And when you have something that doesn't fit you, that was meant for somebody else on somebody else's timeline. I know I'm not the first person to have said this, but nonetheless, people spend a lot of time shopping not knowing what to buy, is what he said before. And that's so, so, so true. First, never torture yourself with the problem of choosing because this destroys the balance. The more stressed you become over it, the worse the result. There is no point spending a long time looking at things, analyzing their strong points and weaknesses. The mind should not be involved in the choice because in this case, the mind is not you. It is the buildup of plaque from pendulums. Just walk around the shops and observe as if you were at an exhibition. Do not think. Now, personally, what I've done is I've found clothes that speak to me simple black shirt and jeans very much like Steve Jobs and I've chosen to have several options of that so that I don't when I wake up and choose clothes I want I don't have to go about choosing so first make sure you have a general picture of what you would like to buy there's no need to focus on the details necessarily it is enough to describe the time of item you want Now, that's the sentence, the way it reads. It may be a translation. It said, it is enough to describe the time of item you want. So he probably means kind of item. For example, you need a coat. Set yourself the goal of choosing a coat without insisting any other superfluous conditions. Let your heart choose because the heart is much closer to knowing who you really are. Your heart will not miss the tiniest detail and will point to the right item at the right time. You will know immediately when you have found the right thing lying among the numerous other items because you will see it and feel instantly drawn to it. I emphasize once again that you should not analyze why you are attracted to any particular item. You just like it. And that is all you can say about it. That is exactly what I was looking for. And then you should buy it without any further thought. Even if you have been looking for something for a long time without finding it, have no doubt that exactly the right item for you is lying in a shop somewhere. If you do not find it in the third place you look, you'll find it in the tenth. It is waiting there for you patiently. And so you should show some patience too. Do not rush about stressing yourself with doubts or getting cross with yourself just so that you can be completely confident I will tell you a little secret about the difference between your things and the things meant for others it is simple as it is reliable as I've already said there's no point weighing up the strengths and weaknesses of the things you are choosing there comes a moment when you have to say yes or no to the shop assistant in this moment you are sleeping soundly even if it does not seem that way to you If the shop assistant or your friend makes a comment about the things you are choosing between, the sleep will be particularly deep. When you are busy making a decision, only your mind is working. It is analyzing the fors and against and building a conceptual justification that is both sound and rational at the same time as listening to the opinion of someone else present. The mind is so immersed in the process that it pays no attention at all to feelings of the heart. In this sense, the mind is deeply asleep and so be it. Do not disturb the mind until it has made a final decision. Wait for the decision and immediately afterwards, stop listening to anyone else. Wake up and tune into the feelings you experienced at the moment you made the decision. How comfortable you felt in this moment will reveal your heart's attitude to the mind's decision. This goes beyond just clothes. This is an example that he's using on how to make decisions. 
So don't sit right now when you ha- haven't, when you don't have to make the decision and start thinking about it and, and questioning your heart. He is making a distinction saying that you need to, in the moment you make the decision, that's when you ask the heart, not before whether you're going to make the decision. I think that there is in that moment more reliability to your heart's always in the moment. The heart doesn't know the future in the past. So you can ask things about the future. It does know the future. It has a sense of things that are foreboding to you, but it lives in the moment and it makes its decisions in the moment. Particularly will tell you things that it's scared of for the future, if that makes sense. When you are busy making a decision, only your mind is working. Do not disturb the mind until it has made a final decision and then wait for the decision and immediately afterwards stop listening. That's all you have to do and start doing that every time you're making major decisions. As you know, inner peace does not signify an unequivocal answer. So the heart cannot always know what is what it wants and is also capable of being indecisive. If you love something, the moment you set your eyes on it and you feel delighted straight away, then the soul is saying yes. Then the mind switches on and begins to analyze and justify its decisions. If at the end of the analysis, the mind also says yes, it means the thing is yours. If, however, you decide to buy something not because you fell in love with it at first sight, but because it is practical, then you should pay particular attention to the slightest hint of inner tension. The soul always knows exactly what it does not want. If you find yourself hesitating or something about the item is inconvenient or causes you slight concern, if you feel that a slight shadow or of doubt or heaviness has been cast, you can be sure that the item is meant for someone else. The mind will try to persuade you otherwise and eloquently list the item's positive points. If you catch yourself persuading or trying to convince yourself that something is right for you because of the style or size, you should immediately put the thing to one size without an ounce of regret because it's not yours. An unequivocal criterion for personal choice can be expressed in one simple phrase. If you have to persuade yourself to have something, it is not yours. Remember, if a thing is meant for you, you will not have to convince yourself of anything. And this is big for me because I'm really good at convincing myself. And I'm really good at overly analyzing decisions. And so this was a big revelation for me because I thought I was doing the right thing by by using what I thought was my intelligence to really analyze and break things down. It was one of the big flaws in my own personality as I started to move into the transurfing mindset that I could start accepting my heart and it took away some of the over analysis that was paralyzing me in many situations. Finally, it is worth listening to other people's opinions when you are choosing something. It's a question he's asking. He says he does not think so. No one but you can choose the things that are yours. If you like a thing so much, you just have to have it. You can be absolutely sure that other people will be very impressed when they see it on you. As far as pricing goes, all I can say is that your things do not necessarily have to be found in expensive shops. However, if it really comes to it, Transurfing can eliminate the problem of money from your life. If you define the goal that is meant for you and strive towards it, rather than striving for money, the resources will come to you of their own accord in great abundance. So there was a, in my own personal journey, there was a breaking point because I would wake up every day using the old Napoleon Hill technique. And I would say, I would give everything and I would say an exact amount of money that I wanted to manifest. And I would be specific because Napoleon Hill said it was specific. And I did that for a long time. And then when I embraced this concept of kind of, okay, I'm not going to be as specific. I'm going to go for a goal. This is, this is the thing I said, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to accept this teaching and I'm going to change what I've been doing every day. 
and I started striving towards something other than the exact amount of money. And all of a sudden, I started getting opportunities, people coming in to my life, people being referred to me, just in all of these different things. It, I was, I, and that's not something that I had experienced before. And so this idea that things come to you when you start focusing on the goal outside of the money is 100% true, verified by me, and I promise you. So tell me, if you try that, if you go about this letting go of the money part and imagine a big goal that you want that will bring money with it, and watch what happens. I would love to see if anybody has had similar experience. As far as pricing goes, all I can say is that your things do not necessarily have to be found in expensive shops. However, if it really comes to it, transurfing can eliminate the problem of money from your life if you define the goal that is meant for you and strive towards it. That is the key passage. I want to make sure we read that again. So the next step is to abandon the desire to achieve your goal. You're calmly aware that your thing is waiting for you somewhere and you know exactly how to distinguish it from things that are meant for another. This assures that important is kept, importance is kept at a minimum level. Immediately after having made your decision, you wake up and allow the awareness of what the decision felt like. This means that you're acting and consciously and determining the, the game script. Having made a final decision, you rely on how comfortable it makes you feel inwardly. You will not be mistaken because fortunately there is reliable support available in this shaky world. Unity of heart and mind. Finally, you will make the task much easier if you forget about strict planning rather than trying yourself tying yourself to circumstances or stubbornly insisting on your own ways of doing things. Trust the alternatives flow. Life can be an easy holiday if you allow it to be. Take what is meant for you calmly and without insistence. As you can see, the process of choosing things encompasses all the main principles of transurfing. You wander around the shops as if you were at an exhibition. You simply observe without necessarily setting yourself the concrete task of buying something. Now, you have a simple but powerful tool at your disposal. Now you can go shopping with ease. And even if you do not want to buy anything this time, you will know that you have protected yourself from other things that are meant for others. You'll be calm and confident in yourself because you know that the thing you need is somewhere waiting for you and you're sure to find it. The main thing is to remember that before you finally answer yes or no, you have to wake up and listen consciously to your feelings. This technique will not work if you're choosing clothes for someone else, for a child perhaps. At least it will not work with the same level of accuracy. Your soul cannot choose something meant for another, so you have to rely on being guided by practical concerns. At the same time, you can give the child the chance to choose for itself. Unlike adults, children are very good at finding the things that are theirs. Of course, this technique does not only apply to clothes, but to any other case where you have to choose something for yourself. I would very much like to hope that this book you are, that we are discussing is yours. The next section is how to become a trendsetter. Do you want to become a trendsetter? Previously, you had to watch how others dressed and try to keep up with the fashion. But did you ever ask yourself who created fashion? Fashions already exist before they reach the salons of leading courtiers. New trends are created by people who are relatively free from pendulums. They are ruled by their own independent judgments and preferences. They dress by listening to their heart and hit the mark. Then their idea is noticed, picked up on by others, and begin to spread spontaneously. This is how they begin to dictate fashion. 
If you blindly follow the latest fashions, you can totally cripple your outward appearance. If you observe other people, you will notice that certain individuals dress extremely elegantly, but not in the latest fashions. You can see immediately that these individuals have a certain edge and it would not occur to anyone to accuse them of being unfashionable. Quite the opposite, in fact. Everywhere you see people dressed strictly to fashion, but you cannot help feeling sorry for them because it does not suit them. They are imitators blindly traveling the road of inner intention towards another's goal, buying into a fashion created by pendulums. Rather than understanding your own prefer- their own preferences and what really suits them, they follow the pendulum's rule, do as I do. A French saying comes to mind that goes, do not be afraid of looking unfashionable. Be afraid of looking silly. Style is just the outer superficial side of fashion. The essence of fashion is conveyed when a person finds clothes that fit the style context and the complement their individuality. You have to be sure of what you really want to look fashionable or to look elegant because these are not the same thing. What do you think is better? Can you dress in some weird retro style way off the spirit of the era? But if the style is yours, everyone will be green with envy. You've probably already realized that following the fashion is nothing other than participation in the pendulum's fashion game. The fads of fashion come as quickly as they go. They are one of the most perennial pendulums. There is nothing wrong with succumbing to its influence. The important thing is to be aware you are doing it and gain the benefit of the fashion for yourself rather than simply paying tribute to it. You can create your own fashion pendulum. It is very simple to do. You just have to turn away from the pendulums and towards yourself. Set yourself the goal of looking elegant and interesting. You do not have to make anything too specific. Just walk around the shops and look at what is on display using the method described above. Forget about the current fashion. Pay attention only to what you are feeling when you look at things. Turn off the analysis apparatus. Stop thinking, comparing, and expostulating. The moment you catch yourself trying to reason and speculate, stop the process immediately because it's futile. Instead, listen to the rustle of the morning stars. You might not be very successful at it when you first start. So it's better not to set a time limit on things. Let go of the desire to achieve your goal. If it does not work, well, you've not lost anything. Take the pressure of having to achieve your goal off of you. Reduce importance and relax control. Just window shop. Try things on out of curiosity. Trust the alternatives flow. It can be useful to run the slide of your goal in your mind while you're shopping. The slide must include the quality of how you feel when you attract a lot of attention because you are you looking you are looking so elegant, interesting and different rather than being a detailed picture of what exactly you look like when that is happening. Give up on the desire to find something artsy and extraordinary? The extraordinaire does not necessarily guarantee success. Believe me, you will stumble upon all sorts of unexpected discoveries. After a while, you are sure to discover unusual and original ways of putting things together. As soon as the heart and mind are united, you will experience an incomparable feeling, a combination of surprise and delight. You'll recognize it straight away, and rather than saying to yourself, that is what I was looking for, 
you will want to cry out something more like, no way, that's amazing. That is how it works. Your potential is only limited by your own intention. The secret to success lies in freeing yourself from pendulums and going your own way. And he has that in italics. So what do pendulums do when they see a new star rising on the horizon? As you know from previous chapters, they light it up. They have no other option than to make you a star, their favorite. Because pendulums need to be in control of everything. They will even help you. And if you're lucky, you'll become the favorite of your own pendulum creation. All that has been said relates to more than clothes, of course. You can apply the same principles to everything you do. It is such a luxurious privilege to be yourself. It is the one privilege everyone can afford. But only a few muster up the courage to enjoy. The only reason for this is that people are dependent on pendulums who need obedient puppets, not free-minded individuals. You just have to understand the principle. Free yourself from their needless influence and be yourself. In other words, the mind has to include one simple truth into its list of references. Everyone owns a precious treasure the uniqueness of their soul. Every individual carries the key to success in their pocket and yet leaves off. Sing it. Have your mind take the heart by the hand, take it to the shops and let it choose its own toy. Unity of heart and mind is such a rarity that you can literally sell a huge profit. All great achievements of art and culture are an expression of this unity. Stars become stars only because people are interested in what is missing from their own lives. The unity of heart and mind. Wow, that's an A fantastic concept. When we see something, a creation, a work of art, a movie, a book that's been created from the heart, the reason that we're drawn to it is because it's what's missing in our own lives, that unity. We can see the unity and our heart is calling out to that because we can, it wants that unity too. Other people's goals is the next section. Until now, We've looked at the outside world as an alternative space with sectors linked together in lifelines. If the parameters of a person's thought energy correspond to the energy of a given sector, that sector is then transformed into physical reality through the process of material realization. On an energetic level, the individual also experiences represents a unique essence imbued with its own inimitable spectrum of emission. There is a lifeline in the alternative space that matches every individual's frail perfectly. And isn't that what we want to find is the lifeline that matches our frail. When a person, now if this is the first time that you're listening to us, a frail, just just refer to that as your soul. When a person lives out this lifeline, they encounter minimal obstacles and circumstances always work in their favor. The soul's frail successfully fits into its own true lifeline and easily reaches its goal in the same way that your own key easily turns in the lock and opens the door. We do not necessarily need to know why and how this happens. What is significant is the fact that each individual has their own path. When a person walks toward the right goal along the path meant for them, everything turns out favorably.
When the opposite happens, and a person turns off the path they were traveling, they meet with all kind of adversity and life becomes a continual battle for survival. This is a tragedy for the soul. You get upset if the weather is foul at the weekend. So just imagine how the soul feels when it sees the unique chance given to it in this lifetime being wasted. The soul can see how the mind infatuated with pendulums ruins its life but it is powerful to change things when the soul comes into this world it does not know exactly what to do what it wants and what to strive for if the the soul does not know exactly it, it can at least guess but the mind will not listen then the pendulums put the mind into circulation, imposing on it their own goals and game rules. They force people to choose goals that are not their own and cra- to crowd around other people's doorways. The soul's feeble attempts to influence the mind come to nothing. So powerful is the pendulum's influence. For many of us, the idea that success only comes from grueling hard work is instilled in us from childhood. Equally ingrained is the idea that you have to stubbornly strive towards your goal, overcoming all obstacles along the way if you want to succeed. One of our greatest delusions is that we have to fight for happiness, be stubborn and persevering, overcoming countless obstacles, and basically fighting for place in the sun. This is a particularly misleading and undermining formula. Let us look more closely at how this received idea was formed. Normally a person turns off their path when they succumb to the influence of a pendulum. Naturally, numerous obstacles start piling up in front of them. If a person wants to be happy, they have to overcome the obstacles, To do they not? Can you guess where the delusion is? Perhaps the delusion lies in the fact that the person effectively begins working towards someone else's goal, passing through someone else's door. But no, this is not it. Again, the answer is surprising. Like everything else in this book, the fundamental misconception lies in the erroneous conviction that if a person overcomes the obstacles in front of them, happiness will be waiting for them on the other side. This is the illusion. There is no happiness on the other side. However hard a person tries, they will always find themselves chasing after the setting sun. No happiness awaits a person in the near or the distant future when they are living a lifeline that is not their true path. Many people just feel depleted when, not without great difficulty, they finally reach their goal. What happened to happiness? Well, it was never there in the first place. It was just a mirage of illusory happiness created by pendulums to make people give up their energy. I say again, happiness is not out there, somewhere, just ahead of you. It is either in your current lifeline right here, right now, or it is not there at all. What does happiness look like in the transurfing model? Maybe it is something you arrive when you have attained your true goal. You're, you guessed wrong again. Happiness is what you experience on the journey towards your own goal, on the path, through your own door. When a person is on a lifeline meant for them and following their own true path, they experience happiness in the present moment even If attainment of the actual goal still lies ahead, 
life becomes transformed into an ongoing celebration. When the goal is achieved, they will be doubly happy. But in the meantime, the process of striving makes every day a holiday. Movement towards someone else's goal always places happiness in an illusory future. Achieving a goal that is not truly yours will bring disappointment and depletion, but never happiness. Your goal is the thing that makes you feel deeply fulfilled. It is not something that fulfills you temporarily. It is the thing that gives you a sense of real joy of life. Your personal door represents your journeying along the path towards your goal, experienced with passion and inspiration. It is not necessarily that everything comes easily, but when you're using your own door, you do not feel depleted. On the contrary, you feel energized. When your work towards your own goal through your own door obstacles are easily overcome and work does not feel like a burden, if you are making maximum effort to achieve your goal, but left feeling uninspired and fatigued, either the goal is not meant for you or you are being or you're banging on the wrong door. These are the features of goals that are not your own a foreign goal always feels like an obligation it is punishing and forced if you feel that your goal represents an enforced obligation in the slightest way you should dump it boldly if the goal is yours you should not have to persuade yourself to work on it because you'll be enjoying it so much when you work towards a foreign goal there will always be numerous obstacles to overcome along the way and it will always be a struggle The pendulum requires everyone to work like a cog in the greater machine, and so when you are working for a foreign goal, you will continue working even though it is a slog, because you have been programmed to believe that everything will come to you eventually if you can just work hard enough. If you are strong and cool, you will master yourself, clear everything from your path, survive hell and high water, and finally win your place in the sun. If you are weak, shut up and know your place. A foreign goal is presented as being fashionable and prestigious in italics. Pendulums need to lure you away from your perfect lifeline. And so they do their best to offer a really delicious looking carrot to trigger the adherence mind into rushing headlong after it. Pendulums cannot always force you to follow the rule as do as I do. You have to want to observe the rule. And so myths are created that tell the story of the star's successful career. The pendulums demonstrate the pattern of their success and leave you with a choice of either repeating someone else's experiences or ending up with nothing. For how could you possibly know how to achieve success? The pendulums clearly know exactly what a person must do to become successful, and the results are there to prove it. As we have already demonstrated, stars achieve success precisely because they do not follow the rule as do as I do. They go their own way. Only your soul can know the algorithm of your own individual success. And that's also in italics. A foreign goal attracts you by nature of seeming unachievable. The human psyche is such that we are attracted by everything kept under lock and key. It is human nature to long to possess things that are unavailable. We all know that. When you were younger and you were told that you couldn't drink, you wanted to drink. It's always that thing that you can't have that is what you want. This feature of the human psyche... It originates in childhood when we have many desires but very little accessible to us. When a child is refused a toy, it will often play up until it gets it, and yet, when it finally receives the toy it so longed for, it suddenly loses all interest. Adults have their own toys and get themselves just as wound up over them as children do. 
For example, a grown up child with a terrible voice and no ear for music thinks they love to sing. In reality, the little nightingale just does not want to accept the fact that singing is not for them. Everyone else can sing. Why should they be any better than me? So when considering your goals, drop the importance of the goal and ask yourself, you, I really want this with all my heart and soul, or do I just enjoy wanting it? In italics, if achieving the goal would mean that you could prove something either to yourself or others, then the goal is misguided. Your goal does not hang around your neck like a lead weight. It gives you genuine pleasure. A foreign goal is imposed by others, also in italics. No one but you can define your goal. You can calmly hear out the teachings of those who know better on how you should act. But afterwards, you must draw your own conclusion and act as you see fit. No one should presume to teach you what you should be striving towards, and such a rude intrusion into your soul should be quickly nipped in the bud. Your heart has enough to put up with listening to the foolish ideas of the mind. No one can point to your goal. The only exception, perhaps being via the casual passing phrase, as you remember, phrases mentioned in passing can serve as signs. When a passing phrase is a sign, you will sense it instantly. An unintentional phrase can unexpectedly ignite a flame in your soul. If the phrase touches on your goal, the heart will become enlivened, prompting you to the awareness that this is what you need. It has to be an incidental remark or a recommendation spoken with no agenda and absolutely no intention of setting you on the right path. A foreign goal always serves to better someone else's well-being. If a goal does not improve the quality of your life, then it certainly is not meant for you. True goals always work for you, for your well-being and success. You're the only person that has need of your individual goal. If a goal serves directly to fulfill other people's needs and improve other people's prosperity, then it is a foreign goal. Pendulums will use any pretext and any means to try and force you to serve others. Words like must, obligated, and have to usually have the necessary effect on people with a heightened sense of guilt. People like this often find solace in absolving their imaginary sins. For others, the slogan, your help is needed, is more effective and it works as you Now understand these methods rely on outer and internal importance. You have to remember that first and foremost, you live for yourself. You do not owe anything to anyone and you are not beholden to anyone. You cannot make other people happy, but you can easily injure others with your own unhappiness. In italics, a foreign goal evokes inner tension. Foreign goals are usually very attractive. The mind will paint a lavish picture of the goal's virtues in all its various hues. But despite its lure, if something about the goal does not sit right with you, then you have to be honest with yourself. Obviously, the mind will not want to listen because it is sure that everything is fine. So where does the shadow of apprehension come from? This is a good time to repeat an important rule from previous episodes of the Reality Revolution. When considering your goal, do not think about how prestigious or seemingly unattainable it is or the means to achieve it. Focus your attention on inviting about the goal and inviting your inner voice to speak. Focus your intention on inviting your inner voice to speak. How comfortable does thinking about the goal make you feel inwardly? Imagine that you have already achieved your goal and all this is behind you. Does it make you feel good or not? If the pleasurable feeling is mixed with anxiety or the heavy feeling of burden, 
this is inner tension. It is really worth committing to someone else's goal. Your own goal will be even more attractive and will give you even more pleasure without having to put up with inner tension. All you have to do is turn away from pendulums and discover your true goal. If you're unfulfilled by your current position in life, or been plagued by a wave of misfortune. It means that at some point you've come under the influence of a destructive pendulum and passed through a foreign door towards a foreign goal. Foreign goals demand a lot of energy and hard work. Your own goals, on the other hand, seem to achieve themselves and everything like clockwork. Foreign goals and doors are always fraught with suffering, and yet when you find your own goals and doors, all your problems will disappear. You might ask, how can I discover what I really want if I do not already know what that is? I would answer this with another question. Have you ever once seriously thought about it? However strange it might seem, the majority of people are so preoccupied with the affairs of pendulums spending all their time running around in circles like the proverbial hamster in the spinning wheel, that they do not find the time for their own soul. People think about what they really want in life in random moments when they are, un when they are under pressure, rushing from one place to another, fleetingly catching ideas in snatches. Determining what your true goal is does not have to involve any deep navel gazing. It is enough to take a time alone to relax and finally let the li listen to the rustle of the morning stars. What if you find there is nothing you really want? If you look inside yourself and have no sense of innermost desire, this suggests that your life force is depleted. Depression and apathy is a clear sign that your current energy levels are only sufficient to support your basic existence. In this case, you should focus on increasing your energy reserves. It is not possible for your heart to have no desires, but you do have to have the strength to hear it. Despite the fact we have said a lot about pendulums already, I would like to introduce some new examples of how they can knock you off track. Ask yourself whether a pendulum is imposing a foreign goal on you under the guise of some noble pretext. For example, an appeal is being made to kind souls to help protect defenseless animals, injured soldiers, starving children, or other vulnerable groups. Or perhaps someone somewhere is fighting for their freedom and they need your courageous heart. The kind soul flies off there and then to wherever it is needed. In reality, it is not the kind heart that responds, but the kind mind. And it is not so much kind as soulless. The mind forgets about the soul and drops everything to run to the aid of others. It is like leaving your own children in trouble to save someone else's child. The kind mind stuffs the heart back into its box to be left in peace with its reasonable thoughts. Spiritual emptiness grows and the mind needs to something to fill it with. Pendulums are quick to offer all kinds of compensation. They will demonstrate a wide range of ways that you can contribute your energy to the benefit of others and yet could not be that spiritual emptiness is what prompts people to respond to the call of others so enthusiastically? The kind-heartedness and uncharitable feeling associated with positive stereotypes is really the effect of spiritual emptiness. Caring for others is the mind's way of compensating for spiritual emptiness leaving the heart's needs unfulfilled. It is in the pendulum's interest to pass up caring for others as compassionate altruism. As you can see, pendulums are very sophisticated when it comes to creating convincing stereotypes, but it is nothing more than a beautiful demagoguery. What about your own soul? Surely your mind will not abandon it to save another. 
This is why I so strongly recommend that you turn your back on pendulums and let the heart out of the box. When you learn to love yourself, you will find your goal. Once you're securely on the path to your true goal, you will commit many good deeds and be able to help those who are poor and unfortunate along the way because you are attracting greater resources and opportunities into your life. Until your own goal is clearly defined, you should be extremely cautious in responding to appeals for help. Internal and outer importance should be kept to a minimum. Pendulums particularly need more energy during their battles. When two pendulums are about to start a fight, one will announce itself the earnest liberator and accuse the other of being a dictator and potentially dangerous aggressor. What the righteous pendulum really wants is to swallow its competitor and take over its oil or other resources, but this is kept under wraps while extensive propaganda campaign is developed in defense of justice and freedom. The person who becomes inspired with importance and takes the pendulum's bait says to themselves, I will free the oppressed people. I will show the dictator and aggressor. At the same time, the other pendulum prepares its own camp of adherence. The pendulum dictator claims that it is the goodies and that, the, that it has the goodies and the pendulum claiming to be the liberator is in fact the true aggressor. Another person filled equally as inflated with importance boils with indignation. How can they have declared war without consulting me? I'll take to the streets and protest. They may, not, they may even rush into the war and give up their life for someone else's freedom. So this is all very specific example. And, and, and when I'm reading this, does anybody think to themselves of, of examples where you've been called out, hey, save this group, save this country. And there's things that are happening all the time that are pulling us away. And that spiritual emptiness inside of us is why we're pulled so dearly to it. And we, because we want to think that we're good people and that we're doing good things for good people. But there may be more to it. And it's an interesting perspective, especially in this day and age. As you can see, the adherents in both camps are drawn into the pendulum's battle. Internal and outer importance is revved up on a background of spiritual emptiness. Rather than feeling the emptiness, the problem is further exacerbated. For what do the adherents have who have been pulled into the battle receive? The supporters of war tell themselves that they've been tricked. The war turned out not to be necessary after all and brought misery to all its participants. The supporters of peace also take a slap. The defenseless nation attacked by the pendulum aggressor hastily disowns its conquered ruler and overthrows the embassy of the protector country of peace, steals its humanitarian aid, and starts to lick the aggressor's boots. The lofty ideals the adherents fight for are like soap bubbles. The surface of the soap bubble is covered with a rainbow-colored film of pumped-up importance, but they are empty inside. Do the souls of the adherents really need all this fuss? There's a very simple way of telling whether the goal you have set yourself serves you or others. If the idea of needing to take care of others originates somewhere outside of yourself, whatever the source, it represents a foreign goal. If the impulse to take care of others comes from deep within your heart, then the goal may be yours. For example, I love spending time with my pets. It is not a chore at all, or I love the kids and I enjoy looking after them, watching them grow up, having fun with them. When the kids grow up, of course, you'll have to find a new goal. No one else can identify your goal for you. There is only one way of finding your innermost goal, which is to reduce importance, turn your back on pendulums, and appeal to your heart to love yourself. First and foremost, and to take care of yourself. This is the only way of finding the path to your own goal. And in italics, he says, the mind's mistake is that it tries from the very outset to evaluate how realistically achievable the goal is and calculate in advance all the ways and means to achieve it. Everything 
has to be logical and reasoned. There is doubt as to whether the goal is realistically achievable, then the mind either drops the goal in principle or stores it away in a distant drawer. With this attitude, you will never attune your thoughts energy to your target lifeline. By thinking about the means to achieve a goal, you attune your thought energy to a lifeline of bad luck because it involves the mind running through all the potential scenarios of defeat. That is why you do not want to focus on how because you can actually re increase bad luck because the mind starts running through all of the possible scenarios of defeat. No goal is ever reached by the obvious means and it will not be a miracle either. Any challenging task is rarely fulfilled within the context of the conventional worldview, which is not surprising because the frequency of a person's thought energy when they are in doubt differs so intently from the frequency of the target line. Miracles only happen when you break the conventional stereotype by thinking about the goal rather than the means to achieve it. Then what previously seemed so unrealistic will suddenly present itself in a different light. As if quite randomly, a totally realistic path will open up in front of you. According to the conventional worldview, this would be called a miraculous coincidence. All the mind can do is shrug, for who would have thought it? From the point of view of transurfing, there is no miracle here. You have simply attuned to the frequency of the target line, decided to have with intent. An outer intention has carried you to a lifeline where new opportunities appear and new doors open, which you would never have suspected existed when your vision was limited to the previous lifeline. We have become so accustomed to stereotypes that we consider them representative of the valuable experience accumulated by humanity over the years. In reality, the pendulums generate stereotypes and people are obliged to confirm to them all society is based on pendulums that develop independently according to their own laws as informational energetic beings and then subjugate adherence to their will. Their influence on man is so great that the mind is literally becoming clouded, losing its capacity for independent conscious thought. Take for example the terrible crimes of the German Nazis during the war, the years of the Second World War. Could it be that the fascists were just particularly cruel people with pathological sadistic tendencies? No, the majority were normal people like you and I. They too had families, loved their close ones and took care of them. And after the war they returned to living a peaceful life like all other normal good-natured burgers. That's the word he uses, B-U-R-G-H-E-R-S. Why is it that respectable family men are transformed into beasts when they enter a war? It is because their mind succumbs to the power of a pendulum. Adherents drawn into the battles of pendulums literally know not what they do. This is particularly evident in the cruel, senseless acts sometimes committed by teenagers. A young and shaky psyche is particularly vulnerable and susceptible to influence. If you took any of these teenagers individually, would you really say that they were cruel? Indeed not, and their parents would swear to it. And yet when they come under the influence of a pendulum, for example, becoming part of a crowd, they cease to be consciously aware of what they're really doing. The mind of a member of a crowd is literally sleeping because it has been caught in the pendulum's trap. You might remember how the induced shift works. All the evil, cruelty, and violence in the world originates not in the darker side of human nature, but in the greedy nature of the pendulum. The human heart knows no evil. All evil is concentrated in the mind, like a plaque that builds up from the destructive influence of pendulums.
And he's used the term plaque multiple times. So yeah, we can maybe look at this metaphor as an example. And we need to brush the plaque off of our brains and get rid of the sugar that is giving us these, these cavities. And the sugar is the pendulums, at least the destructive ones. Pendulums provoke people to use violence, not only against others, but against themselves. What do you think of the brave slogan, no risk, no champagne, nothing ventured, nothing gained? It's content is provocative, a challenge to put your well-being or your life on the line in the name of someone else's idea. Of course, if the idea is your own and the risk is justified, then maybe it's worth it. But there's nothing more foolish than taking reckless action that may threaten your health or even your life. Pendulums provoke people into taking risks because the fear, tension, And excitement the risk taker experiences are the pendulum's favorite energy dishes. Using the stereotype of false courage or the help of another adherent, the pendulum tries to hook its prey. Stick to your guns. Show them what you're worth. Do you want people to think you're a coward? The person filled with internal importance rushes to prove the opposite to themselves and to everyone else firmly in the trap of a misguided stereotype, it does not occur to them that they do not have anything to prove and can disdain the opinion of their manipulators. A person suffering from a feeling of inferiority is easily led by the nose. Rather than a display of courage, taking undue risks is usually an attempt to conceal one's false complexes. The mind irresponsibly throws the life of the heart around in order to accommodate dubious stereotypes. The poor little heart rolls into a ball and observes the frantic mind's actions in horror, powerless to do anything about it. The way the mind behaves towards the heart is at best like a chronic loser venting their inadequacy on their loved ones, and at worst, like a mad animal that slaughters its defenseless offspring. May your mind awake from its heavy apparition to see that it has a wonderful, priceless treasure in the heart. By uniting the heart and mind, you acquire the freedom and strength. Do not be afraid to break through stereotypes created by pendulums. And if you do, you will discover the true nature of many things in the world. Breaking through stereotypes, you open locked doors. That's in italics. Do you have stereotypes that you have used in your mind with yourself or others that has limited your worldview or limited your life? Possibly even taking you into a timeline that you don't like The next section is your goals. I suspect that you already have an innermost goal and at least a rough idea of how to achieve it. It does not really matter though if you cannot see how to make your dream a reality. If you have the will, a way will present itself. The important thing is to define your innermost desire and acquire the will to have and act with intent. Intention transforms desire into a concrete goal. Without intention, a desire can never be fulfilled. First of all, however, you have to be distinctly aware of what you want in life. Obscure wording such as, I want to be rich and happy, will not work. Imagine that you're strolling around town without any particular purpose. You're simply wondering wherever the nose takes you. Where you will end up, no one can say. But if you have something specific in mind, you'll eventually end up there, even if you do not know the way. It is the same in life. If you have no goal, you are a paper boat in a raging river. If you have a set goal and are striving towards it, you might achieve it or you might not. The only 100% guarantee of reaching a goal is if it really is your own innermost goal and you head towards it through your door. No one and nothing can stop you then because the heart's frail, key, 
fits the lock to your path perfectly. No can can take anything. So I think that that's a misspelling and I meant no one can take anything from you that is truly yours. So there will be no problem in achieving your goal. The only issue is how to find your real goal and your real door. He hasn't talked a lot about doors, but a door in this particular case is when something opens to a whole new opportunity. You open a door into something new. Firstly, your goal cannot be determined by a temporary need. Your goal should be the answer to the question, what do you want most out of life? What will make your life happy and joyful? This is all that matters. You can consider anything else to be pendulum husks. Settle on one main goal. Achieve that goal and the fulfillment of your other desires will follow on behind. If nothing specific comes to mind, you start by defining a general type of general goal such as comfort and well-being in life. Ask yourself what comfort and well-being mean to you personally. The need for a house, a car, beautiful clothes, and other attributes can be replaced with the single goal to have a high-paying job. But as you know, this would not be a goal so much as a door and a fairly vague one at that. A high-paying job can be replaced by a more specific expression of the goal to become an excellent or even unique specialist in your field. What is your heart drawn to? The question is whether this job alone will bring complete meaning to your life. If it can, then you are lucky because your goal matches your door. You may be drawn towards a certain field of science, culture, or art and whilst doing the thing you love, make a brilliant discovery or create a masterpiece. On a lifeline such as this, happiness is to be found right here, right now, not somewhere just around the corner. All the attributes of a comfortable life that other people obtain with great effort will come to you seemingly automatically for you are following your own path. Even if you love what you do, if your work does not solely represent the one thing that brings you joy and will fill your life with things that make you feel good, it means your work is a door, but not strictly speaking, a goal. So he's making a distinction here between the goal and the door. The goal is the the end product. The door is the process of moving through to get to the goal. Do not forget that your goal should make your life feel like one continuous holiday with all its accompanying attributes. Do not think about the door, i.e. the means to achieving your goal at this stage. The important thing is to define the goal and then with time, the door will find itself. Ask yourself the following question. What does your heart long for? What would make your life feel like a continual holiday? Put all thoughts aside that focus on the prestige associated with the goal or how difficult it may be to achieve. You should not be inhibited by any sense of limitation. If you do not believe that anything is possible for you, at least pretend you believe it and then you will be free to make a real choice. Do not be shy. Go for it and order whatever you want. If you want to have a boat, what about your own yacht? If you want to have a flat, what about your own mansion? If you want to be head of your department, what about being president of the corporation? If you want to work hard and earn a lot of money, what about not working at all and living a happy life? If you want to purchase a piece of land that is not too expensive and build your own house, what about having your own island in the Mediterranean? The list of whatabouts goes on forever. You cannot begin to imagine how modest your requests are in comparison to what you could have if you went your own path through your own door. 
I see this all the time when people come to me and want to achieve their goals and their goals are so small. I want to, I want to get a dollar raise per hour. I'd love to get that extra $5 raise per hour promotion when they could have so much more. And we're all living in these limited little goals. And what he's saying is true. Think big. And if it's your path that is aligned with your heart, it's all possible. Do not make a wish with your mind. No time spent trying to clarify what your heart really wants is wasted. The expression that something is after your own heart speaks for itself. It expresses your relationship to something, not your opinion. An opinion is the result of the mind's intellectual activity. Your relationship to something comes from deep within your heart. And only this can serve to discern between your personal and foreign goals. When you're defining your goal, ask yourself, how comfortable do I feel in the bubble of the goal now that I have achieved it? Once you've made a wish in order to check whether it is truly meant for you, ask yourself two more questions. Do I really need it? And, but seriously now, do I really need it? Try and measure all aspects of a foreign goal up against the wish. Do you really want this thing with all your heart or do you just want to desire it? Are you trying to prove something? To yourself or others do you really want it might it be a tribute to fashion or prestige an invalid might think that they want to ice skate with all their heart whereas the really the goal comes not from the heart but from the pain caused by their handicap a goal will lure you by being unattainable if the goal is difficult to achieve try letting go of it and observing how you feel afterwards if you feel relieved in any way it means that it was a foreign goal if however you feel indignant or find yourself wanting to protest it means the goal may well be yours so if you have a goal out there that's difficult to achieve just in this moment I would take a moment and let it go and see how you feel If you feel relieved in any way, it means that it's a foreign goal. Now, the only reliable criteria you can use when choosing your goal is inner tension. In italics, he says, the heart's negative reaction to a decision that has already been made by the mind. Now, remember from the previous chapter, the key to understanding the signals of the heart is not when it feels good. It's when it has the inner tension. When it feels good, it just means that it doesn't recognize anything bad, but there's no truth in that. The truth is when there's inner tension, that's when we pay attention. You can only use this test of how comfortable you feel about something after the mind has made a decision about its goal. Imagine that you've already achieved your goal and all of this is behind you. And as soon as you can feel it, must stop discussing the goal and listen to the promptings of the heart. Is your immediate reaction negative or positive? If the feeling of pleasure is mixed with fear, a heavy sense of burden, a sense of urgency or obligation, then the heart is clearly saying no. The mind might not suspect the troubles the goal hides under its beautiful packaging, but the heart can sense it. The feeling of inner tension can be elusive and vague. Try not to confuse inner inhibition with discomfort. As we mentioned in the previous episode on understanding the heart and mind, it is natural to feel some inhibition or a kind of shyness when we experience an unfamiliar situation. Can this really all be for me? Inner tension is a oneness, is an onerous feeling of oppression or strain that appears quietly amid the optimistic reasoning of the mind. In her inhibition can be overcome with the help of slides, but in her tension, never. The worst mistake would be to consider yourself unworthy as a result of the tension. Absolute rubbish. This is a primitive label 
pendulums have forced you to wear. You deserve the absolute best at the very least. Do not be in a hurry to make your final decision. Try testing your goal against the slide technique. If after some time the onerous feeling has not passed, it means that you are dealing with inner tension. If you experience inner tension because of some aspect connected with the goal itself, this means that it is a foreign goal. If you experience inner tension from the awareness that the goal is difficult to achieve, this means that it lies beyond the limits of your comfort zone or that you have chosen a foreign door. Do not think about the means of achieving your goal until you firmly decide on what the goal should be. If you cannot see yourself clearly in your imagined role, it might be that you're not ready for it yet. The limits of your personal comfort zone can be widened with the help of slides and there is no need to worry about the doors. All that is required of you is the will to have and then sooner or later outer intention will lead you to the right door. I went through this process before I started this podcast in trying to find my goal and I went through many and when I tested the goals I followed these reality transurfing concepts before I started and the one that spoke to me the most the one that really called out to me there was no inner tension about that passed all of the tests was to do this podcast and I've done it ever since never worried about the results and it's brought me incredible joy and I've applied this to other aspects of my life this may seem complicated but it's not it's just some offhand techniques to really listen to your heart do not be tempted to make money your goal as if all your problems would disappear and I am very guilty of that I've made my goal specific amounts of money multiple times and clearly that was a mistake because if you say if only you had more money because after all you know what to spend it on remember the suitcase full of notes in the episode we talked about on slides there will there they he said that the money of itself cannot serve as a goal and can only serve as an accompanying attribute to another goal so when i started to to look for goals that could that could help me to achieve that at some point some financial success i started to see success in accomplishing those goals you may readily agree but the statement is less trivial than it appears we are so accustomed to money that we can translate almost anything into a monetary equivalent money is an abstract category designed to help the mind but in no way attended for the heart the heart has no idea what to do with money because it is not capable of abstract thinking the thing is that your end goal has to be comprehensible to the heart the heart has to know what you want to buy with the amount you have requested be it a house casino or private island it's not a matter of the means but the heart must like it all the time that your inner accountant is calculating the means to the end you will not be able to determine your goal or attune your energy to your target lifeline activate your inner guardian and give yourself a nudge every time you catch your mind trying to evade the question what do I want in life the stereotype of the unattainable goal is the most deeply ingrained and so you'll need to be patient the mind will be trying to find the answer a different question how do I achieve it here your heart needs to tell the mind be quiet that's not your problem we are choosing a toy it is important to strive for freedom from destructive pendulums but this does not mean that you have to isolate yourself entirely again go to the episode on transurfing tv with renee garcia and bootsy greenwood about pendulums and renee says in that episode when transurfing first began people would isolate themselves because they were so afraid of the pendulums pendulums can serve you and there can be positive pendulums once the awareness of pendulums is inside of you you do lose some of their they the pendulums themselves will lose some of their power 
all of society is constructed on pendulums and so you're left with no choice other than to seek out your own pendulum or disappear to the Himalayas. It is easy for hermits to converse with eternity when they're living in a distant solitude. But as soon as they return to the aggressive environment where pendulums function, they instantly lose their inner balance and meditative detachment. I never thought of it like that. Maybe the monk that's sitting in the Himalayas is able to reach enlightenment because there's pendulums are not affecting his thought process. Maybe it's the pendulums, the avoidance of the pendulums that helps them. And they never had to go to the Himalayas after all. They could avoid those pendulums here and now. Your goal will also belong to a pendulum but that will not be a threat as long as the goal truly represents your innermost desire. Find your goal and the pendulum will be obliged to make you its favorite. You can even create a new pendulum. The important thing is to practice your right to freedom of choice and not allow pendulums to establish control over you. You cannot determine your goal through analysis and reasoning because analysis is the, is the activity of the mind. Only your heart can identify a true goal and the heart is not capable of thinking. It can only see and feel. It is not the task of the mind to do the searching in your process of choosing a goal. The mind will search its usual way by method of analysis and the construction of logical connection based on common stereotypes and cliches. If a person's true path in life could be determined in this way, everyone would be happy without exception. In italics, he says, it is the task of the mind to process all external information at the same time as paying particular attention to the inner voice. The mind has to establish the precept that is looking for what will make life feel like a holiday, then allow in external information and observe the inner feelings of the heart within the context of that precept. Active searching for your path will lead to nothing. Do not worry about it. Wait and observe. If the instruction for the search has been given, the right information will present itself. A moment will come when you receive a certain information that inspires your interest. At this point, simply pay attention to your inner voice and do not let the mind get involved. You can quicken the coming of the necessary information by extending your circle of interests. Visit places you have never been. The museum, an excursion, the cinema, trekking, a different part of town, a bookshop, wherever. There is no need to actively search for information. Simply widen the diaspora of external information you receive and observe. So there it is. If you need more information, don't go searching, just widen your circle of interest and visit places that you haven't been. Do not set any particular time scale. Don't say that you need this in a week, in a day, in a month. It will always create balancing forces. Do not pressure yourself with temporal limitations or turn the search into a chore. Simply hold the following statement in mind. I am looking for the thing that will make my life feel like a holiday. What's your favorite holiday? What day do you love the most? Is it Christmas or Thanksgiving? Imagine if every day was like that. Be more attentive to your inner feelings than you have been before. Have the statement working constantly in the background of your mind. Pass any information that comes to you through the questioning filter. How do I feel about this? Do I like it or not? Sooner or later, you will come across a sign or some information that makes something inside reverberate. Oh, 
I like it. Think the information through from all angles, remaining carefully attentive. to the small voice inside. So finally, you will have succeeded in resisting the temptation of obsessing about the means and concentrate on defining your goal. When your desire to have with intent and act in the name of achieving your goal, your world layer will undergo an amazing transformation. And when it does, this is what will happen. Your chest will breathe freely, having freed yourself from the burden of false goals. You will no longer feel that you have to force yourself to do things your heart does not feel drawn towards. You will give yourself permission to be happy right here, right now, having abandoned the struggle for an illusory happiness that only exists in the future. The mind will let the heart out of its box and discover the wonderful feeling of lightness and freedom that comes with the onset of spring after a long hibernation. Instead of trying desperately to fill the spiritual emptiness with cheap pendulum surrogates, the onerous feelings of depression and strain will be gone. It is much more pleasurable, is it not, to head towards your own goal knowing that when it comes from within you than to search in vain for your goal in the outside world. Your mind will have rid itself of useless junk and things that belong to others. It will abandon the futile search for the means and simply launch the necessary task into the layer of your world. The heart will choose its own toy and jump up and down, clapping its hands in delight. You have broken through the conditioned stereotype, giving yourself permission to have, despite the seeming unattainable goal. As a result, doors will fly open before you that previously had been closed. The mind will at last have accepted the idea that the goal can be realistically achieved. Life will be transformed into an ongoing holiday and the heart will skip joyfully after the mind. The heart and mind will walk hand in hand together along the smooth, cheery road to the kind of happiness that exists right here and right now. The next section is called Your Doors. If on the path towards your goal, you find yourself constantly with obstacles, it suggests that either you have a chosen a foreign goal or that you have set off through a foreign door. The only thing in life that is genuinely important is the process of defining your own goal and finding your own door. You can spend your entire life working and yet achieving nothing because it is not the right goal for you. Nothing is more disappointing than finally coming to the realization that your efforts were all in vain and life has not worked out the way you dreamed it would. Pendulums have taught people to do what is essential and moreover to accept without question that this is the way that things are meant to be. The stereotype of forced necessity has been taken to the absurd. One would think that life is a term of sentence or compulsory labor that must be served. People are used to demands being made of them so that their heart's true inclinations are pushed to the farthest corner of their consciousness and made to wait for better times. Then life comes to an end without better times ever having presented themselves. The erroneous stereotype depicts happiness 
as something that looms in the near future and which must be achieved, earned, and hard won in order for it to become part of the present. People often abandon the thing they love doing for financial reasons. They divide their activities into leisure and paid work, aside from setting false goals and forced necessity. It's just another method used by pendulums to draw the individual away from their true path. In reality, you can even make a hobby profitable if the hobby fits your goal. If you're forced to abandon the thing you love doing most because it does not provide you with an income, you should look at whether the activity is related to your heart's innermost desire or not. Would doing the activity you love make your life feel like a continual holiday? If the activity is not related to your innermost goal, it is difficult to say whether it will provide you with an income or not. However, if you're certain that the activity you love doing is strongly connected to your personal goal, you can expect it to bring all the attributes of a comfortable lifestyle. When your goal coincides with the door, you no longer have to worry about material prosperity. If a person desires material well-being, it will come into their life automatically. However, the rigid stereotypes of enforced necessity deprives people of the opportunity to throw themselves completely into the things they love doing that fits with their innermost goals. There are numerous examples to illustrate how this happens, such as the eccentric, who has to go to work like everyone else and in his spare time creates and invents things. It never occurs to the eccentric that his creations could be sold to fetch a good price. He lives poorly with total conviction that a mere crust of bread has to be hard-earned and that his passion for invention is just for pleasure. Do you see what is happening? People spend the majority of their lifetime sweating on behalf of the boss man because this apparently is essential for their survival while the soul receives crumbs of time left over after the main job is done. Who are these people living for? The boss man? If your door fits your goal, you will become rich doing the hobby you love most. In the process of achieving the goal, all your other desires will be fulfilled. And what is more, the results will far exceed your expectations, all in italics. Have no doubt that everything in this world that comes from the heart is extremely expensive. Products of the mind, on the contrary, are less highly valued. As you know, a genuine masterpiece is born of the union between the heart and the mind. You will create masterpieces on the path to your goal as long as you do not allow pendulums to lead you astray. It is very simple. All you have to do is calmly follow your path without succumbing to their wily tricks and sooner or later you will achieve huge success. If the door does not coincide with your goal, things can get a little more complicated. However, think very carefully before drawing this conclusion. Your goal should not have to complicate your life. Quite the opposite, in fact, defining your goal will simplify your life significantly and free you of a mountain of problems. Do not be in a hurry to choose a door. When you find the will to have, a door will present itself. If you cannot see clearly where your door lies, work with the slides and widen the limits of your comfort zone. Reduce the importance and abandon your attachment 
to achieving the goal. As soon as you give yourself permission to have, outer intention will offer you an appropriate alternative. The right door is the path that will lead you to your goal. Once you've defined your goal, you can ask yourself the following question. How might this goal be achieved? Sooner or later, outer intention will present you with various opportunities. You can replace outer intention with God in many ways. I think that Vadim Zeeland is using outer intention as a replacement for God. Your task lies in deciding which among them specifically represents the right door for you. Consider all the possible options. Every option should be tested against the inner voice. Here you can be guided by the same principles for choosing your goal. Let us suppose that your goal presumes you to be a very wealthy individual. You will have to decide by what means you're going to become wealthy. For money is attracted not to the individual as such, but to the individual, what the individual represents. A star of show business, a large industrialist, a financial expert, a leading specialist, or perhaps an heir. So what do you want to be? You have to find your own true path to wealth. The thing that calls to your heart and what calls to your heart must be asked of the soul, not the mind. The mind is a product of the social environment and society hangs on pendulums. Society says become a celebrity, a politician, rich, it's prestigious. However, a pendulum can never determine your niche in life because it has absolutely no interest in your personal happiness. Your mind and acquaintances will advise you to look for a highly paid job as a lawyer. For example, they will tell you that once you become a qualified lawyer, you will be earning big bucks. Of course, everyone wants you to earn a lot of money, but this might not be the door that is meant for you. And if you walk through it, you'll end up feeling out of place. If the goal has been chosen wisely, the door will open up opportunities such that you never dreamed of. Let us suppose that your requests include a house, a car, and a good salary. When you walk through the right door meant for you alone, you will receive so much that your original request will appear ridiculous. But you must not err in your choice of door. Do not hurry and never regret the time it takes you to make your choice. You will waste a lot of more time and effort if you rush in and make a choice you later regret. Choosing your goal and door can take months, and that's in italics. During this time, you will have to observe a kind of fa fast of impeccability as strictly as possible following the main principles of transurfing with which you are now familiar. Pr primarily, this is conscious awareness. You have to be aware of the motives for your subsequent actions. Do you behave with awareness and understanding of the rules of the game, or are you limply obeying a pendulum? Keep an eye on levels of internal and outer importance. Think about your goal and door as if you had already acquired them. There is no such thing as prestige, unattainability, or necessity. Be rid of all importance. There is nothing unusual in what you have. Come to terms at the onset with the idea of possible failure. If things work out well, then great. But if things do not work out, it obviously was not right for you and there will be nothing to mourn. Allow yourself to make mistakes. Allocate a place in your life for defeat where you can keep an eye on it. From the text that follows, you will also learn that a disappointing failure need not necessarily mark defeat so much as a landmark on the path to your goal. Find a safety net and a substitute for the door.
Do not leave your previous door straight away or burn all your bridges in one go. Proceed cautiously. Do not pull all your eggs in one basket. Give yourself alter- alternative paths. Just got done reading a terrific book, How to Be a, How to Be a Capitalist Without Capital. And he suggests you should always have multiple ideas when you're starting a business. The reason is you don't know what's going to hit. So you develop a couple of goals. He's saying that, you know, you want to keep your, give yourself alternative paths. Continue to picture the slide of your goal. This will enable you to widen the limits of your comfort zone and attune to the frequency of your target line. Outer intention will present you with the information that you need. To guard against missing any information that outer intention is sending your way, conjure up a slide in your mind depicting the search for your personal goal and door. Filter any information you receive from the outside world through this slide. Assess whether the information is relevant to you or not. At the same time, listen to the rustle of the morning stars and not your mind. Do not track your thoughts in this process. Track whether the information inspires you or weighs heavily in your heart. Take note of the heart's response to any information you perceive. There will be a moment when the heart will zing and exclaim, This is exactly what I was looking for. And again, do not be in a hurry to rush ahead. Expand your comfort zone and attune your thoughts to your target line until such time as the goal and door have been expressed in a clear concept. You have to come to the distinct conclusion, yes, this is what I want. This will transform my life into an ongoing holiday. Your heart will sing and your mind will rub its hands together in satisfaction. He's mentioned that several times in this chapter, the idea of being an ongoing holiday. And after I had read this chapter, I started to notice there is something to this that I had started to have days that seemed like holidays on a regular, on a Wednesday when I have a bunch of cool stuff happen. So I, I tend to tell you experientially that there's truth in this. If the heart is singing, but the mind is still in doubt, work again on expanding your comfort zone. This will enable you to break through the delusion that will hold you back, that the goal is not realistically achievable. Do you know why the door seems impregnable? It is because it is padlocked with the false stereotype of unattainability that sits in your mind. When you break through the stereotype, the door will open. I'm not calling you to believe me or yourself or anyone else for that matter. You will never succeed in forcing the mind to believe anything. The mind only accepts on an unconditional basis nothing else. In order for the door to become real, you have to transition your target lifeline and only your target slide can help you achieve that shift. At the beginning of your line, the goal lies ahead of you in the future, but the mind will be able to see a clear path to it. It is futile to try and convince yourself that something is achievable or to fight to overcome stereotype. This is not what breaking through the stereotype is about. The stereotype will crumble automatically when outer intention shows you the new opportunities that await you on your target line. This is why I draw your attention to the fact of not trying to persuade yourself of anything and battling with stereotype. All you have to do is systematically run the target slide in your mind. If you don't know what he's talking about with target slides, check out my episode on understanding how to use slides, and I give a full explanation of that. It is a visualization technique, and that chapter explains it much better. 
far from being a meaningless speculative exercise picturing your target slide, represent a concrete step towards your goal. Do not forget that material realization is inert, and so outer intention cannot carry out your order instantly. You will need to be patient. If you run out of patience, then you obviously have a passionate desire to achieve your goal as quickly as possible. If this is the case, go back to the beginning and reduce the level of importance. If you desire something, it suggests that you doubt whether the goal is realistically achievable. So work on expanding the limits of your comfort zone once again until you can see the real prospects unfolding. It's the ultimate Chinese finger toy of law of attraction and reality transurfing, if you understand my analogy. You desire something and that's bad. You intend something and that's good. If you deeply desire something, then that's bad. So you have to find a way to find something that you deeply desire, but then reduce that desire, the importance of it. The reason that this is discussed is that it works. Pendulums may disguise your true door with the mask of insignificance and low value. Everything you are capable of doing comfortably and willingly has meaning and value. You do not have a single meaningless virtue, any characteristic folly that appears to have no meaning within the context of rigid stereotypes can be the key to the right door. Try holding your characteristic foolishness and silliness up against serious doors. For example, if you have a reputation for being a clown, perhaps you could become a great comedian. If everyone says that you are no use and you spend all your time dressing up and titivating your appearance, maybe your door leads to the profession of top model, makeup artist, or designer. If you are irritated by bad adverts and love to shout about how the advertising should have been presented totally differently, it is not because you're in a bad mood. It is an expression of a hidden desire to demonstrate your abilities in that area. I've listed specific examples, but generally speaking, personal qualities that are usually considered useless can be expressed in unexpected ways. You will discover this for yourself if you turn away from pendulums to face your heart. Think about it. If you really do display some kind of silly behavior willingly and with ease, it will be a purpose to it. Everything said above relates to the process of choosing the right door. If you are already on the path to your chosen goal, there is a way of determining whether you have chosen the right door or not. It is not the right door if you get tired on the path to your goal, becoming drained. If, however, when you are busy doing something that brings you closer to your goal, you are filled with inspiration, you can boldly claim that this door is meant for you. There's another way of testing whether a door is yours or not. A foreign door might pretend to be yours, opening up before you, but at a critical moment it will slam shut in your face. Everything may go quite well initially as you pass through a foreign door, but eventually when you find yourself right at the cutting edge of things, failure will befall you. When this happens, you will know that you passed through a foreign door, that they deliberately opened public doors to lure in adherence, illustrates just how insidious pendulums are. As a rule, private individual doors do not have a crowd of people hustling around the entrance. Even if you meet people who say they would like to pass through your door, they will step aside instantly clearing the way for you to walk through unhindered. Public doors are open to all and the sundry, but only a few will walk through them. Remember how the pendulums create myths surrounding the star's success, successful career in an attempt to force everyone to observe the do-as-I-do rule? People are entranced by the mirage and crammed together around the same entrance, whilst the true doorway for them stands just next to it entirely empty. 
even a door meant for you personally will close if you crudely contradict the law of balance by giving it too much importance or putting all your eggs in one basket yet if you reduce importance the door will open and then it will reopen he returns to these ideas later on in this chapter the next section is intention I believe that you have taken the time to choose the goal and door for you it shows that you have intention intention is what transforms a desire into a goal without intention desires are never realized and dreams do not come true a goal is different to a dream in the same way that intention is different to desire when you have intent your dream becomes a specific goal empty dreams and castles in the air will not change anything in life only intention the will to have and act can change your life let us suppose that you've managed to define your goal and are full of the will essential to achieving it you're burning with impatience to get going this is the moment to release the grip reduce the importance surrounding your goal and abandon any attachment to re reaching it so that all that is left is intent all that remains then is to act within the context of purified intention to do everything that is expected of you without desiring or pushing for the end result the only thing that can spoil your progress along the path to your goal is taking on the burden of excessive responsibility, making excessive effort, extreme diligence, or coercion. In the context of the conventional worldview, this may sound strange and unfamiliar. However, I hope that by now you at least will not find the idea absurd or harebrained. Now we are going to turn everything on its head. When you are moving towards your goal through the right door, there is no need to apply excessive effort. Nor should you have to force yourself to do anything. If you find the opposite is true, you've either chosen the wrong goal or the wrong door. The mind is accustomed to struggle and having to overcome obstacles and yet the mind creates all these problems itself by attributing excessive meaning and fighting against the alternatives flow your ideal lifeline will contain minimal obstacles as long as you do not lean too hard on importance go after the goal in the same way that you go to get the post from the letterbox what will remain of your intention if you purify it of importance and desire? All that remains is the will to have and the need to be to place one foot in front of the other. Stop imagining the post to be a problem and simply put one foot in front of the other in the direction of the letterbox. Do not think about the problem act create momentum irrespective of how things might turn out and then the problem will be resolved in the process inner intention of the mind will urge you to slap your hands about in the water i insist that such and such happen outer intention functions entirely different to inner to internal intention it turns out that such and such has happened all the time that you're insisting on something pressuring for something to happen you're preventing outer intention from realizing your goal in harmony the alternatives flow for how can the mind know exactly how the goal should be realized moving towards a true goal through the door that is meant for you is like passing along a well-trodden road no one and nothing can stop you if importance as long as importance is kept at a minimal level and you refrain from fighting against the alternatives flow because you are walking your true path you have nothing to worry about even if difficulties temporarily arise 
Give yourself permission to enjoy life and accept everything that comes to you as a gift. As soon as you feel a cloud forming over your holiday, try to discern where you have increased importance. What is it that is preying on your mind? There is a ready answer to this question. You are forcing yourself to do something. You're overly impatient to achieve your goal or you're attributing something excessive importance. Relax your grip. Oppressive thoughts and feelings can arise as a result of a narrow comfort zone. For example, if as a result of achieving your goal, you plan to receive a large sum of money, a whole range of anxious thoughts may instantly pop up. Where should you keep it? How should you invest it? What if I lose it? How should I spend it most wisely? What if they take it back? With that state of mind, you are not ready to have the money. When the realization of the dream is fraught with these kinds of issues, inner inhibitions will inevitably arise and with the subconscious striving to free yourself of the cause. In this case, outer intention will work against you. The will to have must be constantly maintained, although it is not essential to be picturing the target slide in your mind all the time. It is a pleasant thing to think about the goal you desire, and so you don't, do not have to use persuasion or co- coercion. You can try and convince yourself of something until the cows come home, but you'll never be successful. Unlike auto-suggestion, with intention, the decision has been made, and the decision is final. Nothing is open to discussion. The goal will be reached. That is self-evident. Any doubts will fall away of their own accord as you continue widening the limits of your comfort zone. I wish to warn you against making a major mistake. There is one more false stereotype to be aware of. This stereotype encourages you to think positively and only examine successful potential outcomes. However strange it sounds, this is indeed a false stereotype and there are so many. Do you think you could manage to limit your thinking exclusively to successful outcomes? Hardly. If you strive to exclude negative potential outcomes from your script, it will not work. Because it's almost impossible to convince the mind that everything could go smoothly. The mind is perfectly capable of acting the part, pretending that it believes the scenario you're presenting, but deep in your heart, you will still have doubts because the mind is doubting. The heart will unquestionably come across the negative alternative where the mind has chucked in the closet. You do not need to include any scenarios in your target slide that depict you in the act of achieving your goal. The target slide must simply depict a final picture of what life looks like to you once the goal has already been achieved, as if you already have it. All that is required is that you take pleasure in watching the slide and that you put one foot in front of the other with the help of purified inner intention. Visualization of the process involves working on the scenery, but in a completely different way. You convince the mind Not that everything will go smoothly, but that everything is already going smoothly. Visualization of the current link in the transfer chain should keep pace with what you're doing now and what you will be doing just one step ahead of that. In convincing yourself that everything will come to a favorable fruition, you continue to hold the deadly grip of control. Relax the grip. Do not think about the problem that has not happened yet. Just go calmly with the alternatives flow. I have an episode that you should listen to called Understanding the Alternatives Flow and meditation on how to ride the alternatives flow so you can better understand what he is referring to when he talks about the alternatives flow. But what do you think about that? One of my favorite things about transurfing is the simple idea of intention and how it is a mental exercise 
and changing the way that you visualize your goals. This particular exercise states that it's an intention, that you will receive it. There's no hoping, there's no wanting, there's no deep desire, which reduces the importance. And understand that this is like a Jedi mind trick for manifestation and it works. Understand what he's really saying. It's the way that you think about your goal because you can go through your mind and create new thoughts that willingly destroy your goal and not be aware of it. The intention part is the Jedi mind trick to change your mind the way it constantly thinks about your goal. That's all this is. And that's how you should look at it. Realization is the next section. I walked on the wet pavement. It had rained in the morning and so the worms had crawled out of the lawns onto the pavement in search of meaning of life and new horizons. The fate of the worms concluded differently. The lucky ones managed to crawl to the neighboring flower bed laying with deep black soil. Some were packed at by the birds Others were squashed by the souls of monsters walking along the pavement. Then the sun came out and warmed and dried the moisture. The sun's rays reached one worm who had crawled to the middle of the path. And by the time it realized its mistake, it was too late. It would not have the strength to crawl to safety. A slow and painful death would hover above it until the worm dried out completely. Suddenly some mysterious power lifted it up and threw it onto the wet ground. From the point of view of the worm, what happened was theoretically impossible, and it had no way of understanding, let alone explaining, what had saved its life. Whereas from the point of view, nothing supernatural had taken place at all. I was simply sorry for the little worm, and so picked it up and threw it onto the flower bed. Evidently, the lonely pilgrim has chosen his goal and the door very well. If your goal seems unattainable, the entire holiday will be spoiled by doubt and depressing thoughts of failure. How do you ultimately believe in the impossible in order for it to become possible? Isn't that the question? When I talk to people that really want something incredible and I hear some goals that are truly mind-blowing if they could when if and when they are accomplished but how do they convince themselves that it's possible and even more importantly i've talked to people in other countries countries like and somebody from uganda and somebody from kenya and have told me that the country that they're in and the situation that they're in and the environment they're in is so difficult that they're not able to convince themselves of the realism of this goal. So they're trying to answer that question here. And the answer is you cannot. That it's impossible. What a stupid question. You just cannot. So I return once again to what I I said above. There is no way of successfully persuading, convincing, or forcing yourself to believe something. Put these meaningless cares to one side and get back to doing something more beneficial. The process of putting one foot in front of the other in the direction of your goal. Do not worry if the goal seems unattainable. It might be difficult for you to imagine how your goal could be at all possible to achieve, but really, it is a loose, useless concern. All you have to do is make your order properly and leave the rest to the waiter. Many people who have achieved phenomenal success all say that, in hindsight, they would never have believed they were capable of achieving such amazing results. When the heart wants to strive towards the goal and the mind is worried about the means, mutual understanding between them is blocked. The heart has no concept of the notions of a means. It's in dreaming The heart is used to getting anything it desires because in any striving is instantly brought about by dream intention. Where the soul flies off to whilst the mind is in deep sleep, no one knows. 
We only remember the dreams we have in a lighter sleep state when the mind is dozing. Unfortunately though, our dreams cannot serve as a criterion for the desires of the heart. Because as soon as we wake up from a deep sleep, the mind resets the heart's sail in accordance with its own expectations and experiences. We are unable to remember the soul's past lives for the same reason. If, of course, they actually happened. Unlike the heart, the mind comes into this world as a clean sheet of paper. There are many accounts of how the human mind has had access to information from past lives under the right circumstances. However, past lives are a separate issue and go beyond the scope of this book. By the way, if you would like to try a past life regression to discover your past lives, check out my recent guided hypnosis, uh, which is a past life regression. I'm really proud of it. The music turned out great on it and you might be able to get information about past lives. The mind has to consider the means because it is used to acting within the limits of inner intention. Within these limits, there will undoubtedly be potential scenarios with an unfavorable ending. And so in this case, outer intention not only will not help you, it will act to your detriment. This is why I so insistently recommend that you stop thinking about possible scenarios of how events might develop. On the path to your goal, the will to have must prevail. This is what you should focus on above all else. And the remaining aspect of intention, i.e. the will to act, must be purified to the maximum from the undesirable elements of desire and importance. The will to place one foot in front of the other represents the inscrutable intent to do the minimum of what is required of you. To act dispassionately does not mean to act indecisively or sluggishly. I'm sure you know what I am trying to say. Excessive will is also a consequence of importance. Your actions will be effectively to the degree that you manage to purify inner intention from desire and importance. You should think through scenarios of actually achieving the goal in general terms only enough to determine the main stages of the path, i.e. the links in the transfer chain. Once this is done, it is important to let go of thinking about the general scenario altogether. At this stage, only the target slide should occupy your thoughts. The target slide should only include the final picture of your life once the goal has been achieved without any additional scripts. Turn this slide over in your mind continuously. Live inside it. Your comfort zone will begin to expand and the parameters of your thought energy will become attuned to the target lifeline. So. Understand what's happening when you're visualizing. He's giving you another explanation of why visualization is so powerful. Because when you're going through this process of visualizing and you're living exciting, you expand your comfort zone. Oftentimes just visualizing and seeing yourself doing something that you might not normally do. The process of visualizing allows you to imagine having done it. And when you are present it with an opportunity in which you can do something, it's a little bit easier. And so there are some things that may be outside of your comfort zone. And so look at the comfort zone as one of the keys to visualization. Eradicate any desire or importance from your attitude to it all. If you're trying to make a huge effort to achieve the goal as soon as possible, or you doubt your abilities or fear difficulties, It means your importance level is embellished. Give yourself permission not to be perfect and to make mistakes. And if you do not allow yourself to make mistakes, you cannot expect others to be lenient towards you either. If you fear that the goal is unachievable, it means you have strong desire. But how can one not have desire? Accept the possibility of defeat in advance and consider emergency exits and backup plans. Have them prepared unless you take this step. You will not be able to free yourself of desire. 
So if you have something that you're trying to achieve, give yourself some backup plans, some emergency exits, so that if it doesn't work out, you have some backup plans. It's pretty much, you may not ever use those, but mentally that changes the way that you think about it. And he's talking about the way that you think about it. Most importantly, whatever happens, never put all your eggs in one basket. For example, never ditch everything and throw yourself into an infatuation. What if you suddenly discover that you made a mistake and taken a foreign goal and door to be your own? Then having placed all your bets on one card, you destroy the balance. There must always be some kind of counterbalance, fallback option, or retreat. Because when you have these, your heart is calmed. And balanced forces will leave you be. For example, do not leave your previous job until you are guaranteed of finding a new one. Do not slam doors behind you or burn bridges. Be careful and prudent. Even if you are absolutely certain that the goal and the door are your own, it is still better not to make any sudden movements that could, in the case of misfortune, leave you without a crust of bread and a roof over your head no one is immune to misfortune. In any case, you are now armed with the powerful transfer surfing technique. And so you should have less cause for fear and anxiety. Now you at least understand the rules of the game, which is something in itself. People normally participate in the games of the pendulum world without knowing the rules and so lose straight away. The methods you have become acquainted with here will give you a huge advantage. But that's not all. In the remaining sections of the of Transurfing that we haven't discussed or we'll have on future deep dives, you will learn about Transurfing's what he calls heavy artillery. If you do not get in Outer Intention's way with intense actions motivated by heightened importance, it will most certainly deliver you to your goal. Go with the alternative's flow. Do not try to fight against it. The mind's habit of controlling everything may cause you to go against the tide, but you will agree that it is better to trust the flow, for no one is given the gift of anticipating every move ahead of time. If you are practicing visualizing your target slide, outer intention will guide you. And because your outer intention works beyond the limits of familiar scenarios and stereotypes. It will introduce unexpected changes. The mind will perceive these changes as unfavorable and respond by slapping its hands in the water, spoiling everything. To avoid this from happening, allow the dynamic of change to take place organically. So you have some, you go in for a goal and you have sudden changes that happen and the mind freaks out and stops it and you're moving towards what you wanted all along. So you got to let go of your grip of control on the situation. If something does not turn out as you expected, do not hurry to correct the situation. Instead, try and see the unexpected event in a positive light that shines in your favor. At first, it may not be obvious, but in the majority of cases, you can begin to see the truly positive nature of the event. People upset themselves unnecessarily, for in reality, things really are not too bad at all. I'm not suggesting that you should blindly believe the saying, all's for the best in the best of all possible worlds. There are two seeds of truth in this saying. One is obvious and one is more obscure. The obvious part relates to standard stereotypes and presupposes that things are not that bad overall. Indeed, the alternative's flow always takes the path of least energy expenditure. Problems always involve huge expenditure of energy and what is more, are generated when a person fights against the current. People only interpret changes in the direction of the current as a problem because it does not fit with their plan. Hidden grain of truth in the saying, 
has much greater weight. The point is that if you can take it into your head and to perceive the seemingly unfavorable change in the scenario as a positive thing playing for your hand, this is exactly how things will be. This statement might seem harmless as well as doubtful. Nonetheless, here there lurks a great force which we will talk about more in future episodes. When you are going with the alternatives flow, you can accelerate your speed by using a paddle. The paddle is the visualization of links in the transfer chain. Unlike the slide, this type of visualization includes a script of how you move towards the goal. But as you know, visualization of the current link does not include the entire script, just a fragment of it that relates to the present time. You place one foot in front of the other, guided by your current intention. Whilst you are taking one step, you simultaneously set the intention to take the next. Remember how a mother watches over her child as it grows. In every moment, the mother is visualizing the current link in the transfer chain. In her mind, the chain consists of several tiny links. She delights from the fact that today her child stood up, unaided, and imagines that the child may take its first step the next day. A mother does not imagine her child growing up into an adult overnight. She takes joy from the present. She caresses the moment of now in the firm knowledge that tomorrow new achievements will be made. Visualization of the current stage in the process of achieving your goal should be practiced according to this same principle. Today is better than yesterday and tomorrow will be better than today. There is no point in trying to anticipate every coming turn in the alternative's flow. It is better to take pleasure in the present moment and simply dispassionately and impeccably place one foot in front of the other. Imagine that you wanted to go for a swim in a pool, but in order to do so, you have to first run 100 meters and jump into the water. Now, imagine that you dive to the ground straight away, sweeping your arms before you have reached the water. Of course, this is absurd. When visualizing the current link in the chain, a statement is made about the successful status of the course of events at the present time. Everything is going well. This provides the foundation for the next rung of the ladder. Tomorrow will be even better. You mentally intend to step on to the next rung higher than the previous one. When this happens, a feedback circuit is created. As a result, the stages of moving towards your goal are imagined as climbing up a ladder. Coming success is mentally imagined not as a cloud hanging in the air, but as a ladder on which every rung supports the one above it. Your level of success has a rising tendency like climbing a ladder every day brings with it a particle of coming success. Do not worry about the future. Live the present. On the path to your goal, Pendulums will find all sorts of ways of knocking you off course, taking any setback as par for the course. Nothing ever goes entirely smooth. When you upset yourself over a setback, the rung you are currently standing on breaks and you end up sliding back down the ladder. This makes you cross and sets off the inner critic because the things you have stopped going according to the mind's plan. When this happens, you are caught on the pendulum's hook. You will never cross onto a lifeline filled with happiness and good fortune whilst you are dissatisfied with yourself. For when well-being and good fortune shine upon you, are you not pleased with yourself? How can you get onto these lines if the parameters of your thought energy are attuned to self-criticism. Do not forget that the mind only perceives an unforeseen change in the alternative's flow as a failure. 
because it is not written into the mind's script. Why not accept the change and see the setback as a success? Try playing the flowing game. Greet every setback with joyful surprise rather than annoyance. Now, I know this is hard. Some setbacks really, really are tough for people to take. But just get into the habit of finding something about it that gives you joy. I know that's hard, but when you start, you're going to start being able to do it. And greet every setback with joyful surprise rather than annoyance. This one thing is remarkable. It's just a tiny little change that you make. You're going to see changes in the overall way that your reality unfolds when you start doing this. For apparent setbacks are the work of outer intention that moves us towards our goal in ways unforeseen to us. Perhaps that very setback is what's needed in the script to get you to the point that you need. How can the mind possibly know exactly which path leads towards the goal. The mind thinks the goal is difficult to attain precisely because it does not see the single path among the well-beaten tracks that leads you to your goal. Naturally, you will not achieve anything unless you give in to the alternative's flow and allow outer intention to nudge you on to the right path. Do not watch how other people walk their path to success or try to keep up with them. Do not give in to the herd instinct. You have your own calling. The majority take the roads well trodden, but true success is achieved by the few who refuse to follow the rule, do as I do, and independently tread their own path. And that brings me to the final word of warning. If you associate your dream with the idea of helping those close to you, everything could go wrong. For example, you may think along the lines, when I realize my dream, I'll be able to help my loved ones. The heart is selfish by nature. And as things stand, it receives just a modicum of what it desires in life. So one can hardly imagine it possible for the heart to think of anyone else's happiness besides its own. And that's a crazy thought. The heart is selfish by nature. We think that the heart is loving, and it is, but we think that the heart is not selfish, but the heart is selfish. The heart does not really care about other people, no matter how near and dear they are. It thinks only of its own well-being. Its life in this world is a remarkable and unique opportunity. Contrary to popular belief, all gestures of altruism originate in the mind, not the heart. The heart will do anything possible to achieve its innermost goal. But if the goal serves someone else instead... It will lose all interest and leave the mind free to exhaust itself, battling to find the solution to its one task. In the well-known Russian fairy tale of Buratino, the wooden boy sets himself the task of getting rich in order to help his father. He reasons that if he plants golden coins in the fields of miracles, a golden tree will grow and then he will be able to buy Papa Carlo a theater. Naturally, he does not achieve his goal and causes the small boy all sorts of troubles. So ask yourself right now, is your goal designed to help other people? Buddha Tino makes two major mistakes when he sets his goal. His first mistake is the goal does not serve himself but someone else. And I'm not, and this is not advocating for you to be selfish. We're talking about the d- dynamics of the heart when you're making these choices and when the heart the heart is the thing that gives us power there's lots of things that you can be unselfish about when we're talking about key and critical decisions particularly big goals that we're making don't set those goals for other people set them for yourself burutino's heart dreams of something for itself whilst its mind envisages papa carlo's future well-being 
Altruism is a wonderful quality to have, but if you choose to devote yourself to serving others, you will never find your own happiness. To perceive your personal fulfillment in service to something or someone else, in helping the weak and defenseless, or in giving yourself fully to someone else's vision or idea is nothing more than an illusion and self-deception. In the illusion, the mind has been seriously gripped by a pendulum and sees its happiness exclusively in service to it. However hard the mind tries to convince itself that it has found happiness in service to other people or to some lofty idea, this person's heart will be miserable and forced back into its box with no strength to even verbalize its rights to personal happiness. The conviction that another person's idea is one's own or that another person's happiness represents one's own fulfillment is a misconception held by people who have been unable to find their own goal or perhaps have not even tried. Buratino's second mistake is that he sees money as a means to an end. As you will remember, money can serve neither as a means nor a goal. Money is simply an accompanying tribute, attribute along the way to your goal. There is no point in sharpening your focus on money. Quite the opposite. As a rule, chewing your money thoughts only create harmful excess potential. If the set goal is truly yours. Money will come to you of its own accord and you will not need to worry about it at all. The tale of Buratino is the perfect illustration of this. And Zealand has repeatedly mentioned this, that you do not want to make the goal the specific amount of money or as a means to achieving your goal. Imagine a goal that is expensive or whatever. If you too were to achieve it, that you would be incredibly wealthy or successful but don't imagine the money imagine accomplishing the goal and everything else will come with it the fairy tale confirms the idea that if you find your own happiness first you can make other people as happy as a result because you can achieve your goal money and well-being come to you then obviously you have ample opportunity to help the ones you love because you will have greater resources at your fingertips for now whilst you are only on the path to your goal you should put your own happiness first then you will avoid frightening your heart away from the goal on the path to your goal allow your heart to think only of itself once you have achieved your goal you can afford your altruistic mind as much freedom as it desires in looking after your loved ones nature homeless animals starving children and whoever else you feel drawn to help the next section is called inspiration once on the path to your goal through the right door you will be racing the crest of the wave of good fortune you will radiate harmonious energy because of the feeling of ease that has entered your heart we have already talked about transmission in the episode I did on the wave of fortune and how to drum up and maintain an emotional high and it can be quite difficult to maintain this feeling consistently but once you are experiencing the joy and peace that comes from unity of heart and mind the quality of energy radiating from you will adjust itself everything will start to pick up various problems will find a way of disappearing and inspiration will visit you often provided you do not try to evoke the feeling intentionally inspiration is a wonderful thing but for some reason it has become cloaked in an aura of mystery and inscrutability it is assumed that inspiration is extremely difficult to find and that it appears spontaneously and always unexpectedly like a muse that pops in for a bit without prior warning then the muse flies away just as suddenly as she appeared without returning for long periods of time 
The suffering one agonizingly awaits his lady's next visit, but nothing he can do brings her to him, and the solution eludes him. In reality, everything is a lot simpler. Inspiration comes from union between heart and mind in the absence of importance. The first part of the definition will be clear to you. Inspiration is the state of elation, which makes the creative process easy, simple, and most importantly, brilliant. It is quite clear that this can only happen when there is a union between the heart and mind. You are never truly inspired when you are working on something you do not feel passionate about. When you're focused on working towards the realization of your goal, you will definitely achieve unity of heart and mind, and this will serve as the essential condition for inspiration. However, this unity alone is not enough. Why is it that inspiration suddenly appears and then disappears somewhere? Perhaps it leaves when we are fatigued, and yet in an inspired state, you can usually work for many hours before being overcome with tiredness. The second part of the definition of inspiration gives us to understand where inspiration comes from and where it disappears to. You can probably already guess that this is a, a, what this is about. The thing is, inspiration does not appear from anywhere. It is simply freed up when the importance potential drops. Wherein lies importance? Firstly, in, in the passionate desire to achieve your goal, and secondly, in the insistent striving to find a source of inspiration. As I have said many times, desire will not help you achieve your goals. Painful hankering after a goal whips up a whirlwind of balanced forces instead of the wind of outer intention, which quickly scares all your kind fairies and muses away. The desire to invoke inspiration has the same effect. Any preparation and subsequent expectation of inspiration creates the excess potential of importance. You may be carefully arrange your work area in a minute detail, tidy up, put everything in its proper place, be well rested, prepared, and in general have created all the necessary conditions for a meeting with your muse. In your intense preparation, you will have materialized the potential of importance causing the wind of balanced forces to start howling alarmingly outside your window. Then you set the table, light the candles, and sit in expectation of a visit from the temperamental lady, but she still does not appear. And you can be sure she will not appear because inactive writing is like desire squared. Outside the window, such a hurricane of balanced forces is raging that no winged lady would dream of flying up to your house. If you show signs of impatience bordering on despair, the raging wind will smash windows making chaos of the energy in your house. The commotion will build like a wall standing between your heart and mind, and it will take some time to reestablish the connection that existed previously. Can you see how change, charged preparation, anticipation, and desire really are? So go back to the idea that Neville Goddard mentions that feeling is the secret, and we've mentioned that repeatedly on the show, and it is an important concept that Zealand is taking to the next level. If when we have a feeling we we broadcast out a frequency and we get things that come after we send out this signal things come into our energy field that are similar we can do that in our meditation we can sit and feel something but we're only doing that most of the time we're walking around just just throwing out these emotions just broadcasting them out randomly all the time and so if you're sitting there in despair or you're desperate or you're impatient and man, sometimes it's hard. Well, what happens is every single time you're doing that, you create balanced forces that, that, that can arise because of those thoughts. So it's tough. How do you avoid impatience? You just got to remember these particular things that intention is important. Let go of the deep emotions that are accompanying your goal. Likewise, inspiration will not come to you until you release the stranglehold of anticipation. Inspiration does not arrive. It is freed up in the moment 
that the potential of importance leaves us. And the other way around, inspiration is clamped the moment the impatient mind drives the heart back into its box to wait. In the end, the mind's nasty habit of subjugating everything to its control ruins the whole party. Nonetheless, despite inspiration's apparent insubordinate and unpredictable nature, the mind has an excellent way of bringing inspiration under its control. It is just that the element of control that has to be used totally differently to how the mind is used to exercising control. Usually the mind beats against the window pane. Once again, the window pane analogy with the fly flying into the window pane with its inner intention whilst next to another window is open. Now the mind must do the exact opposite. First, abandon the desire to achieve the goal. And that is hard for a lot of people out there. Can you do it? If you have ways to reduce your desire in achieving goals, put your techniques in the comments and I would love to read them. Is it truly yours? You will not succeed in getting rid of it for long anyway. Sooner or later, the goal will be fulfilled. The will to have and the complete absence of insistence and determination on your part play the key role. Take what is yours calmly and without pressuring the situation, just as you would take the post from your letterbox. All inner intention should do is place one foot in front of the other on the way to the letterbox. Uh, the letterbox is obviously a Russian translation. He's just talking about a post office box. But you're, when you go and get your mail, he's used this example twice. That's supposed to be an example of how you set your goal. You just go get your mail. Now, secondly, forget about specially preparing for the mystery. Any preparation for inspiration to come to you in whatever form creates excess potential because all the time that you are busy getting ready for it, you are signaling that you wish to attract something you do not currently have. The idea that you deep down know that you don't have it creates that separation. It is a Chinese finger toy. Again, we have this Chinese finger toy of reality creation where you cannot, you have to be careful because you create excess potential because you're, you're getting, but you signal out getting ready for what you want that you do not have. The more carefully you carry out the preparatory ritual, the worse the outcome will be. If you think back, you can probably recall situations When you consciously prepared for an action, event, or meeting, but things did not work out, the meeting did not happen, and the plan fell apart. If balanced forces are capable of disturbing the interaction between material objects, they can blow away a barely discernible whiff of inspiration as lightly as a feather. Third, abandon the habit of waiting for inspiration. Is not it right that inspiration comes when you least expect it? So why wait for it and negate the condition required for it to appear? So let us suppose you have observed these three conditions. All that's left of your personal inner intention is the will to put one foot in front of the other, i.e. to take action. Just start. And what is more, start without waiting to feel inspired first. And in the process of doing, inspiration will come to you. If you're sitting around and you want to write or make a song or create or do something towards your goal, don't wait for inspiration. Just start doing it. And then the inspiration will come. I love that. Inspiration is freed up in the act of working. This is something that I found I desperately wanted to write a book for a very long time. And I'm not saying that my book's going to be this great book. My goal was to finish the book, just to put some ideas down. And for the longest time, I would just sit at my desk waiting for inspiration to do it. And the secret was for me to just start writing. And yeah, a lot of it was terrible, but it doesn't matter. I was able to start the process and then I started receiving inspiration as I went. As you know, intention in action disperses excess potential. 
So this is the scene you end up with. You set the table for yourself, light the candles for yourself, make yourself comfortable, and begin drinking tea for your own pleasure without waiting for anyone else to arrive. You can be certain that the whimsical muse will be affected by your display of indifference, wondering how you could have forgotten about her. She will appear, instantly fall in beside you, and that is the secret. I think he gives another example earlier where you just, if you, if you're waiting for your muse to appear, you just set the table and you start, start eating dinner and and put a plate out and eventually they'll show up. (laughs) So reviving the goal, what should you do if you have set about achieving someone else's goal, but do not want to abandon it? Can a foreign goal be achieved? Indeed it can. Armed with the transurfing method, you will have a huge advantage in comparison to those who do not know the rules of the game in the pendulum world. However, achieving a foreign goal requires considerably more effort. And you should be aware of this fact. On the path to achieving a foreign goal, you should allow yourself to be guided by the same principles described for following your own goal. The only difference being that all those principles have to be followed with the utmost impeccability. That is all that remains to say on the subject of achieving a foreign goal. That's one paragraph on how to achieve the foreign goal. So you can do it. If you've chosen to work towards a foreign goal and feel that you would like Zeeland's advice on whether you should abandon the goal or not, or have not fully grasped the principles of Transurfing Method, the Transurfing book only gives a map of the general area and discloses the rules of the game. You have to make the decisions yourself. Transurfing cannot help you if you're not ready to take full responsibility for your own destiny. These methods will only work if you take the helm of intention into your own hands. You now know how to handle the helm, but it is for you to decide in which direction you wish to travel. Only pendulums can provide ready solutions, but relying on other people's decisions, you place your destiny in their hands. If it is too late to abandon a foreign goal, you can achieve it quite easily by freeing yourself of desire and the excess potential of importance. There may be many obstacles on the path to a foreign goal, but the majority are born to the mo- of the mind itself when it fights against the alternative's flow and pumps up importance. Detach yourself. Act in a manner that is both emotionally detached at the same consciously aware. Do not battle with problems and obstacles. Reduce importance and they will withdraw. Suppose that you're moving towards your goal, but have met with formidable obstacles along the way. What causes them? Now you can pinpoint the reason more easily. Analyze the situation to discover where you have overindulged in the level of importance. Examine what you have attributed excessive meaning to and where you have tried to fight against the alternative's flow. Reduce importance, detach yourself from the situation, trust the alternative's flow, and things will improve. The goal may remain equally elusive if you're setting off towards it through a foreign door. Perhaps it would be worth looking around and choosing a different door. However, before you boldly swap doors, be sure to reduce importance first and see what effect that has. Even your own door can slam shut if you have somewhere attributed significantly embellished importance. For example, if you place all your eggs in one basket, the goal will have too great a value. The door will reopen if you reduce the importance and give yourself the protection of having an alternative route. As a rule, foreign doors that once stood wide open will at some stage in the game slam shut quite unexpectedly. There is such a rational explanation for this that the mind will take its hat off and shrug its shoulders in bewilderment. Who would have thought of it? What happens is the opposite to what happens when the mind puzzles too deeply over the means to achieve the goal to see a realistic strategy. The right door. The thing is that if the goal is genuinely yours and you are ready to give yourself permission to have, your true door will open. If you give yourself permission to have, even foreign doors will open before you thing is if the goal is genuinely yours and you are ready to give yourself permission to have your true door will open just as suddenly as a foreign door closes give yourself permission to have just as you may have 
more than one goal. You have more than one door. In fact, you have several, hence, it is never too late to look for a new goal, even if your several previous goals have become objectively impossible to attain. There is no reason why you should not go after a foreign goal through a foreign door searching for your own goal along the way. There is no need necessarily to abandon something that has already been started. The shift to your target lifeline can be orchestrated quite smoothly. You can be working towards a foreign goal and holding a mental picture of your own goal slide in your mind at the same time. Then outer intention will, with time, open unseen doors that will allow you to painlessly change your activities. It is unlikely that anyone can free themselves totally from the influence of pendulums that strive to impose foreign doors. It is likely that you previously burst through the wrong door, even now. That you have more knowledge, you are not immune to error. Everyone makes mistakes. The important thing is not to fall into despair or criticize yourself too harshly, you will eventually find your own door. A person who never made a mistake never tried anything new. You're surrounded by people who live like robots, who do not set themselves goals and do not read books like this one. These people want more, but they do not have the intent to act. The advantage people like this have is that they do not make mistakes. You, on the other hand, will undoubtedly make mistakes. All you have to do is use them. True success grows from the ruins of past failures. You will inevitably encounter difficulties when you knock at foreign door. From the outside, it will be obvious to everyone that you are having to overcome obstacles and are battling with various problems. But that is just the superficial view of things. No one, including you, will see that deep down your heart is strongly opposed to having to walk through a foreign door. The mind oppresses the heart with its forceful will, insisting that they fight to the end. But even in people who are very strong-willed, there is a limit to how long the heart can take being oppressed, and things end in crisis. The annoying thing is that the crisis can take the form of committing an unforgettable faux pas. When a person is in a state like this, they easily make very basic mistakes. It can happen to anyone, including the powers that be. On the path that leads through a foreign door, you can expect there to be a moment of crisis and you can expect to make mistakes, but try to avoid making blunders. Rent yourself out, proceed with impeccability. The paradox is that a major mistake tends to be forgiven more easily than a minor oversight. Do not expect any sympathy, even from those closest to you. If your loved ones are the slightest bit dependent on you either materially or socially the worse it will be for you will have failed their expectations accusers and manipulators do not set themselves high goals which is why they do not make mistakes do not give them reason to accuse you of an unforgivable if relatively minor offense be impeccable in the small things then any crisis you have on the path through a foreign door will be less traumatic. It is also advisable to be cautious of the advice given by loved ones who definitely want the absolute best for you. It can be awful to watch compassionate parents predetermining their child's goal in life from very early on. If you are decidedly going your own way in life and suffer some kind of defeat, you can expect no mercy. They will cry, we told you so but you never listen to us. At this moment, your, your position will be very weak, upset by the misfortune you had to endure and the manipulators around you will exploit your weakness trying to get their claws into you. It is more convenient for them that way because they get to assert themselves while you are on hand, resigned and submissive. Anyone finds themselves in a quandary will always attract advisors, and manipulators pursuing the same goal to put you in your place to seize the opportunity of manipulating you of going up in their own estimation by coming all the old soldier over the newfound foul up their words clothed in the packaging of sincere participation can be translated as follows whatever did you think you're getting yourself into did you think you were better than us sit here and keep your head down like we do 
We know more about life than you do. In a moment of weakness, doubts will sneak in. Maybe they're right. I don't know what I'm doing. You inevitably ask yourself whether it is worth listening to the advisors and manipulators and how might they be right? Only in the fact that you have made a mistake. Anyone who ever tries to achieve something will have times when they make mistakes, even if they are guided by the advice of those who supposedly know better. Only you can find your goal. No one else can do this for you. Even those who genuinely wish you well cannot look right into your soul for you. Even you hear the whisperings of your heart as the rustle of the morning stars, i.e. barely audibly. Do not give in to the influence of other people. Believe in yourself. In the search for your goal, do not listen to anyone and follow your heart. As far as choosing your innermost goal in life is concerned, you have to be persistent and adamant in relation to pendulums and extremely attentive to your own heart. As you can see, the only excuse in the process of choosing your destiny is the fact that not all goals and doors in the alternative space are truly meant for you. This does not mean, however, that you cannot choose them. Nothing prohibits you from making such a choice, but you can expect to encounter problems as a result. Do you really need that? When you choose foreign goals and doors, you are taking the path of greatest resistance. The whole beauty of the freedom of choice lies in the fact that personal goals and doors appear to the individual to be so much better than any other. But in order to indulge in freedom of choice, you have to free yourself from the influence of pendulums that impose foreign goals and doors. Another long chapter. But let's, let's summarize this chapter, which we've talked about goals and doors. And in particular, he talks about a foreign goal. And a foreign goal is always punishing, coerced, and feels like an obligation. A foreign goal appears in the guise of fashion and prestige. A foreign goal attracts you with its apparent unattainability. A foreign goal is imposed upon you by others. A foreign goal serves to improve someone else's material well-being. A foreign goal is just a goal that is not meant for you. A foreign goal will make you feel uneasy. And in the process of achieving the goal, you will fulfill all other desires on the way. What is your heart gone to? What would make your life joyful and happy? Do not think about the means until you have clearly determined your goal. Having made the decision to be aware of how your inner voice responds, slides can eliminate inner inhibitions but never inner discomfort. The heart always knows exactly what it does not want. It is not the mind's task to do the searching when you are looking for your goal. It is the mind's task to absorb information from the outside world at the same time as paying particular attention to the still inner voice within. Your door is the path that will lead you to your goal. If you cannot see the path, Picture the mental image of your target slide. Outer intention will open your door for you to your target lifeline. If you experience a feeling of inspiration on the path to your goal, you know that you have chosen the door meant specifically for you. Everything you do willingly and easily has meaning and value. Do not include scripts in the target slide. You already have what you want. Do not put your goal and door in one basket. Find a potential substitute. Do not slam any doors or burn any bridges. And do not allow yourself to be influenced by others. Trust yourself. Hopefully this will help you to identify what goals are best for you by listening to your heart. And what goals are foreign goals. What doors are meant for you. Understanding the idea of intention in reality transurfing and knowing that you can get the inspiration that you need by taking action with intention. This is a wonderful chapter and if you're out there struggling to find your goal or if you have a goal that you're moving towards, I really hope the information in this helps speed up what you're doing and gives you focus and clarity on how to take the next step 
And as he says, you're taking one step after another and that's it. So thank you so much. And I always enjoy these deep dives. I could talk about this one forever. This is very important. This goes to the core of what we're trying to do with Transurfing, Reality Creation, Law of Attraction, and the Reality Revolution. And that's achieving goals. Having things that we, we visualize in our mind occur in reality. It's a wonderful thing. And if you understand these steps, you can do it too. You can do it all the time. Your intentions can be realized every time. Let me know what you think and let me know what kind of goals that you have and if you've had problems achieving your goals. If you have questions whether or not a goal of yours is a foreign goal or not, put it in the comments and let everybody else comment and see if we can help each other out. I would love to know your path towards your goal because any other information that we have in this process can help everybody else out. Thank you so much for sharing this time with me. I hope you've enjoyed the music and this wonderful information. Every episode of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. Email me anytime at media at advancedsuccessinstitute.com. For coaching, go to advancedsuccessinstitute.com. I send out waves of good fortune to everyone listening. And welcome to the Reality Revolution.